Okay, great. Well, welcome everybody and uh, happy April 1st, April Fool's Day for some. Um, and um, we are um, very pleased to open today's uh, talk with, uh, we were just saying some great news, um, some great events that have happened in our world. Um, and that is, one of them is the, uh, the Pope um, saying his apologies and acknowledging the the harms made by um, the residential school um, events um, and uh, tragedies. And so fantastic, fantastic start to spring um, to have those talks and the reconciliation started starting uh, with the, the church, Catholic Church. So today um, we are going to um, move on our momentum, carry our momentum going with this spe uh, speaker series uh, with uh, a talk on scientific racism and nursing from Dr. Jifa Dordunu. I'm going to, I just posted this agenda so that we know how we're going to proceed today. So um, after our welcome and land acknowledgement and our housekeeping rules, we will go right into um, our, our presentation from Dr. Jifa and, um, and then we'll have a conversation and question and answer following her talk. Then we'll do a stretch break and we'll post the, post the uh, questions for reflection and go into our breakout rooms, followed by a large group discussion, which will be moderated by Dr. Annette Schultz. And then I wanted to also uh, remind everybody that this session will be recorded um, and will, the recording will end after the presentation. So the conversation and the question and answer um, sessions and our breakout room discussions will not be recorded. And I wanna welcome everybody who's here and welcome Nita, it's really nice to see you here. And uh, all right, and here we are. So I am wanting to acknowledge that the land of the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and the continued harms of today. We dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. I, as a first generation immigrant, am grateful to be part of this land, and I am committed to working with all communities to create a peaceful life on this land. In the same spirit of peace, I want to acknowledge the plight of the Ukrainian people who seek refuge as they flee their homeland. This crisis affects us all, and we wish the Ukrainian community continued strength and hope in this time of turmoil and great loss. And our housekeeping rules, um, just as a reminder to please keep your mics muted and to maintain each other's privacy and confidentiality during our conversations. And to raise your hand if you would like to speak uh, or put it on the chat as well. Uh, we have, we all have a part in playing and ensuring that this is a safe place to share. And this is the agreement that we have posted in our past speak um, talks from the EDI um, uh, agency here at the University of Manitoba. So I will just speak to these and that we will speak for ourselves and allow others to speak for themselves with no pressure to represent or explain a whole group. We will listen with resilience, hanging in when something is hard to hear. If tempted to make attributions about the beliefs of others, we will listen, consider, instead consider asking a question to check out the assumption that we are making. We will assume good intentions without ignoring impact. We will keep in mind that understanding and agreeing are not the same thing. The story shared here, and we want to share the ideas. So with no uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce our um, speaker. So one year ago, an article was published in the Canadian Nurse entitled, 
collecting race-based data is a good first step to equity, but should not be the only one. One of the takeaway messages from this article was that the social construct of race is not a good measure for stratifying people for sociobiological purposes. Today, we are privileged to hear from the author of this work, Dr. Jifa Dordunu. Dr. Jifa Dordunu is a native of Georgia, Ghana. She's an assistant professor at the University of Victoria. She has over 20 years of very clinical practice experience working in general medicine and coronary care units, as well as outpatient clinics at John Hopkins Hospital. She has extensive working experience as an investigator initiated and in industry sponsored clinical trials at John Hopkins University. A program of research leverages dis dissemination and implementation science to address factors that influence quality of care and patient outcomes. Working in interdisciplinary teams, Dr. Dordunu has published several articles in peer review journals. She teaches both in undergraduate and graduate programs. She holds a bachelor's degree with distinction from the University of Victoria, a master's degree from Duke University with post-master certificates in clinical research management and teaching. She completed her doctoral education at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, with a focus on heart failure. Dr. Dordunu is the co-founder of the Coalition of African, Caribbean, and Black Nurses of British Columbia. Welcome, Dr. Dordunu, and I'm going to turn the uh, table over to you. I'll stop my share. Thank you so much, Katie, for that welcome. And thank you all for tuning in today. There we go. Can you see my screen and everything okay? Yes, it's great. Okay, fantastic. So again, thank you. The uh, title for my talk is Scientific Racism and Nursing. And I just wanna say that sometimes some of these topic, the topic around racism uh, can be emotionally charged. And just a disclaimer that whatever I say today is really I'm representing myself and not uh, any institution or organizations that I'm affiliated with. And I also have no conflicts of interest to declare. So again, thank you so much for the invitation to be here with you today. I'm deeply uh, humbled by the, uh, by the gesture. I want to acknowledge that the, uh, where I uh, live and work is the tr traditional and ceded territory of the Lekwungen people. That's where the University of Victoria stands. And the Sohi, Esquimalt, and Wasonic peoples uh, have a historical relationship with the land till this day. Hopefully the timer's not on and it's not gonna keep doing that. So today, the objective of my, of my talk today uh, and my goals are to, um, when, when I teach this topic in my nursing class, I tell the students that in order, we have to be willing to look backward and inward so that we can move forward with consequential compassion to think globally and act uh, locally for a more equitable or sustainable world. And so that is the framework that I have used to sort of unpack this notion of scientific racism. So I'm going to use that same framework uh, with you today. And basically what that looks like is, um, generally speaking, we wanna talk about the history of blackness and whiteness. Where does that come from? How does that, be, how did that begin? And how does that frame the, uh, the work that we do? And then uh, looking inward, I always think that is uh, super important for all of us to be reflecting, continuously reflecting on what the changes are in our environment, in our knowledge, in our scientific landscape, and how does that impact my own story and my own views and values. And then I'll talk a little bit about how do we move forward. And moving forward is really, for me as a nurse uh, who teaches uh, primarily, uh, my responsibility is teaching and research right now. And ultimately, if I was also seeing patients, my responsibility of how do I move forward with everything that I have learned. So to 
put that into a sort of a personal framework, uh, I'll give you a bit of a discussion around the one story, the one African story, and then uh, tell you about my own African story and how that has all ultimately led me into unpacking this notion of scientific racism and how that uh, impacts my nursing practice, whether it be research, education, or patient care. So looking backward, um, the one African story that you or may all of us here might be familiar with, and that is the African story of the transatlantic uh, trade of enslaved Africans. As you may all know, I won't, this is not a history conversation, but um, the history of it is that in the 16th uh, century, that uh, um, different countries from uh, uh, European country descent uh, people took Africans as slaves, transport them across the uh, Atlantic Ocean to the various parts that are represented here on the map. Personally, coming up, coming to North America, this was not a story that I was aware of. Uh, I was very uh, aware of colonialism, but the enslaved, the uh, tra uh, transatlantic uh, trade of slave enslaved Africans was not something that I was aware of until I moved into the um, into into North America. And just you know, as you can see here that the number uh, and there's been an estimated 12.5 million people that were uh, transported by this um, trade between the 16th and the 17th hundred. Um, and most of them came from the West coast of Africa. I do want to acknowledge that there was also a Northern uh, African transatlantic uh, trade as well. But again, because of my orientation being North America, that's why I'm speaking more to that one. So as I started learning more and hearing about the, the one African story in North American story, I was curious to find out more about the um, the, the slave trade. And so I, uh, Emory has a data, database. So I went into that database to start looking into how many people have actually been transported. And uh, here you see the detailed ship records of the different countries that would involve the number of people that had been transported over the, uh, the, the centuries. And as I said, an estimated 12.5 million people, many of them didn't make it through that middle passage, but uh, this is what the ship records have noted. I asked myself as I was searching through the database, well, based on my own uh, social location, is there anybody that was um, transported from where, from my tribe, so my, my cultural group, uh, of people, have any of them, were there any of them in um, the shipping records? And so I did a, a query of the system and a query came up with 384 people that were identified as Eve. That's my uh, tribe, I'm an Eve. And so I looked through those lists and one of the interesting thing I noticed was A, the name, our names are very unique. So we're named often after the day that we're born or our names usually have a meaning to it. And so there was a person, a young, the youngest person that I was able to identify through the record name was Kwashi, so the Q-U-A-S-H-I-E was the name that was put in the record. But I know by just the sound of the name that what they really meant was to say Kwashi, this is the actual spelling in uh, a parenthesis, which means that it was a, a Sunday born boy. So my thoughts actually started going to, wow, what would it have been like for a five-year-old, that was the, the person's age, to be transported across the Atlantic Ocean and what became of him 
in his life and his descendants and all of those uh, things. And I can't say that that didn't weigh heavily on me, uh, being a mother and all of those things. So uh, this was just one way that I started to learn more about that one African story. And just to mention that the 384 people that I identified in the data set, one thing I, I was curious was the naming again, didn't always seem consistent with our culture. So I had contacted a couple of my uh, uncles and had asked them to look through the names to see if they think all of the people named in the record were in fact an Ebe's uh, from the Ebe line. And they concluded that maybe about 200 of them were, and the other one were probably from the northern part of the present day Ghana. But um, one day I'll publish that paper, but not, 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 it hasn't been published yet. And so once the transatlantic uh, slave uh, trade was coming to an end, the colonizers actually turned their eyes onto the continent of Africa. So many of you will also know that the continent was divided among uh, the countries represented here uh, at the Berlin Conference. And um, where I am actually from, my traditional territory was uh, divided or given to the Germans. And then after the World War, uh, the German lost uh, control and to that. So there was a prevacy that was created for Britain to oversee that land uh, that was previously held by the German. And once Ghana became a republic, so the Gold Coast, when was the Gold Coast and Kwame Nkrumah was um, uh, organizing that sort of um, uh, independence, the the, the land that was of the Eves joined the Gold Coast to become what we know as the present day Ghana. So that is in essence, is sort of the, um, the one African story that I was um, focused or had been researching. And so then I started thinking to myself, okay, this is the, the one African story out there. How about myself? So looking forward, but looking inward, where do I come from and how do I situate myself into this larger discussion of the African or the black people? And so, like I mentioned, this is the, the Eve land, um, which is now part of the, um, it's actually been divided. So part of it is, uh, um, Ghana, the other part is Togo, but culturally we do have similar culture and language um, and values and religions and what have you not. And actually I'm from like a little village around here named Doda, like uh, Katie had mentioned. And then of course, you know, I can't talk about myself without <clears throat> talking about where I'm from, meaning like who am I from, like my parents, my uh, family. And so in the uh, left corner here, this is my grandmother. My grandmother is actually a queen mother uh, in, our, uh, in our area. And she essentially was a leader. She was an individual that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, she was an individual that people, uh, a community leader that people sought out to resolve conflicts. Um, and so I grew up, you know, seeing her facilitate a lot of discussion around many people. So for me, if there were somebody that I admire and respected and hope to even just be, a, you know, a little bit of, is her. And this is a picture of myself uh, in the northern part of Ghana, my family, my parents, my grandmother again. I have two younger siblings, and this is the village where and the place where I spend majority of my upbringing. Um, you know, it was intergenerational uh, setting. My grandmother, my mom, my grand, my uh, grandmother, my cousins, my uncles. We all kind of live in this sort of communal uh, space. And of course, I started my education there. Um, this is also a picture of just some of the things that we do culturally. So I think this must have been a funeral that we were all dressed up for. And I, I put this picture there only because people don't, uh, people don't believe me when I say, oh, I can still wash, I still wash things by hand and 
you know, cook all of those uh, traditional stuff. So I always uh, include that picture uh, for a showing stake to say that I still, you may take the, the girl out of the village, but you can't take the village out of the girl. And of course, once we left Ghana, so uh, uh, in the early two, uh, 1990s, we left Ghana. And the interesting thing that I've learned about my travel is that it actually mirrors those of the transatlantic uh, trade of the slave uh, enslaved Africans. So we initially went to Liverpool and Liverpool was one of the ports with the first uh, ports that um, uh, many of the slaves were uh, taken to. And then after we left uh, Liverpool, came to uh, Vancouver. And then from Vancouver, I went on my own little journey into different parts of the United States. And then ironically returned back to Victoria. And so along those journey that I was just telling you, there were always um, this nagging thing that uh, always was on my, um, my heart and my mind and this notion of blackness. I didn't understand why people would call me black. I, I didn't grow up in the village. Nobody ever called me a black person. They call me by my name. They call me, you know, so-so-and-so's daughter. So the, the concept of blackness was really, really uh, unique and strange to me. And one of the times in which that uh, was called into question was a article. So like I said, uh, you know, Maybe some of you guys are all nurses here, but uh, I had got, gotten off a night shift at a local hospital in BC. And I was walking home, came across the province, uh, province uh, newspaper and uh, the front page said, Africa on the brink of extinction. And my th first thought was like, oh my God, maybe an asteroid had hit the continent. And for some reason, they all, if, all of us are gonna die. And so I got closer to the article and started think uh, and started reading it, and it was talking about the impacts of HIV uh, on the continent. And so I sat there for a minute and thought to myself, "There's just some a lot wrong with this title of Africa on the brink of extinction. It's every single person on that planet, on that continent, sorry, HIV positive, and they are going to die." Hmm. Interesting uh, thought. Then later on in my academic journey, uh, this is one of the uh, papers that I, uh, abstract that I submitted to the Heart Failure uh, Society of America. And when we were preparing this, we had a lively discussion around collection of the race, the variable race. And so, you know, I was working with brilliant, brilliant surgeons and cardiologists. And so I asked them, why are we collecting race? And what are we going to do? But more importantly, what are we going to do about it if we find it to be significantly different among the people that we're looking at? And, you know, we thought about it, it was like, well, we don't actually do anything about it, but we always collect it and we always report it in our paper. Again, um, that conversation didn't actually give me an answer that I was looking for. And it's been down the, later down the road when I started doing my own research. So this is my, a paper from my own dissertation. And uh, here you see the race was, uh, I collected the race because that's how I was trained, right? And what I found was that it was not a significant predictor of outcome. And this was to me uh, revolutionary because of all the heart failure data papers that I've read up until that point, Black people, mostly of Af American uh, descent, were always had worse outcomes. They had worse readmission, higher deaths, sicker, everything that you mentioned, man imagine, was always worse with the Black race. And so, you know, I, I, I couldn't make sense of it because my data was speaking the opposite of everything that has been published before me. And so when I came to defend my dissertation, somebody, a colleague of mine asked that, Jifa, why is it that your data is different from uh, what we all know about heart failure? And I honestly did not know the answer. And I said, you know what? My suspicion is something in my data set is controlling for that effect of blackness that has been uh, published. 
but I'm going to have to do a deeper dive in a deeper um, thought about this. So that set me up on a journey of uncovering what is racism and how does the uh, variable race may actually be speaking to racism versus what we may have been uh, presenting in the literature up to date. So the definition that I'm going to be giving to you here is that racism is ideology that classify people based on anthropological characteristics. And based on that, you know, people of European descent had been put on a higher, uh, on the top of the hierarchy, and they were deemed uh, that, um, sorry, excuse me here. Just need to move this. A hierarchy, so uh, other races were not fully uh, human, right? And so that hierarchy actually, whether we like it or not, exists throughout everything that we do. And so the more, uh, you know, white people were more able to advance more so than blacks, than other colors and other ethnicity. And it is my suspicion and my, uh, not suspicion, it is my uh, belief that the unit of race, what the different categories that we have as race is really a unit of measure of racism. So let me say that again. So if we think about racism being the scale that we are on, then the way you're classified is that unit of measure of racism or the amount of it that you may be experiencing. And so the that then led me into understanding, well, what is race? How does race came about into, us, uh, into the Northern American society? And what I found was that race actually began in the US anyways, uh, showed up in their census in the 1800. And, usually, and the categories that it was presented with was slave, white, and other. Over time, that category of slave went to free, colored, mulatto, Negro, Black, and now African-American. So in essence, the wording has changed, but the experiences of it has not. And so then that then take, took me onto this journey of, well, if that's racism, what exactly is scientific racism? And what uh, scientific, it's again, this is not something that I have coined, this is something that's well uh, published and noted, is that is the misrepresentation or misusing of the idea that our physical differences, whether it be skin, hair texture, color, so on and so forth, for, which forms race, actually speaks to the biological underpinning for health outcomes. So let me just think, you know, slow down. I do get quite excited and talk quite fast. So let me just say that again. So the idea of scientific racism is that the physical attributes which race is based on, right? That speaks to the biology of us. We know that that is not true. They have mapped out the human genome. Granted, it wasn't a diverse mapping that it was done, but they have mapped it. And what we have found is that there's only one biological human race, that's homo sapiens. So whether you identify as black, as indigenous, as uh, Asian, as one not, we are homo sapiens. So being a homo sapien means that if, you know, if I were to cut you right now, or if I were to cut myself, the same, the same processes happen among all of us, right? And so this notion that many of the health disparities that we see is rooted in our biology is not quite true. And so genetically, they have told us to not be using these racial groups and categories to be biological uh, predispositioning because again, the evidence just does not support it. An example of what, how scientific racism actually manifests is um, in this the thesis, and by all means, please, you can Google it and see for yourself. It's titled Separate But Equal. And it talks about the Canadian blood system and how it uh, uses the racial uh, category of blackness 
right? So uh, an example, for example, uh, is that in the blood donation policies and criteria, there are uh, cutoffs for blood work, right? So typically people of African um, uh, uh, ancestry, people of African ancestry uh, can have lower uh, than the normal, what is classified as a normal range for something like hemoglobin. But because the normal cutoff is greater than what most people of African descent have, it means that they're never gonna be able to qualify to donate blood. And so, you know, the blood system then wants to, you know, diversify or increase the diversity of the donor pool. But if the policy is uh, excluding or the limits that are established are going to be excluding a lot of people, then you're never gonna increase that diversity. Another way in which the scientific racism is represented in a blood donation uh, system is, you know, in the 90s, when they had the whole scandal around the unsafe blood um, uh, supply, the system had chosen to prohibit it, people of Haitian descent of donating blood based again on this ideology of scientific racism. In fact, the, uh, the, the, the physician who invented the um, blood um, uh, storage mechanisms, he himself resigned from the committee because of this idea of scientific racism, which is that the blackness of somebody's skin, they, you know, that the system uses it to discriminate against them. You know, your blood is not good enough for me. Your blood is not good enough to be trans uh, to, to be transfused into other people's bodies, and then it starts to scream and yell about well, black people don't donate blood, but they're not donating blood because your policies just are not inclusive enough. So you know, I know uh, CBS is you know committed to hopefully addressing this and making sure that the policies that they're creating is rooted in the modern day uh, scientific knowledge. And uh, just continue with the uh, with that ideology of scientific racism. Again, people think that it is that, that us as human beings are nicely divided into categories of five races or more. The truth of the matter is that it's not. You know that is just not true. There are you know you might I might find somebody of European descent that is biologically more similar to me than somebody that has the same skin color as myself. So the di diversity among us is more like this representation, as you can see, versus what has been created based in the slave era. Uh, era. The dangers of scientific racism is all around us. So whether it is naming diseases after people, right? And it wasn't until the, this current pandemic that I personally have seen a concrete effort from the scientific community to be uh, thoughtful about the way they uh, name diseases. So, you know, for example, the Ebola virus. Ebola is a place, a location, right? So if you meet somebody and they're from, oh, I'm from such and such, what is gonna be happening to you as a person knowing that there's a virus that is named after the group or the area that people are from? It creates biases, it creates stereotypes. Um, obviously the COVID-19, um, uh, you know, we all know what certain president was trying to call it. And you know, you and I both know what the political agenda there was, but we've been doing that for centuries. We've been naming, you know, diseases after African, people of African descent for centuries, making this association between our skin color and that of the uh, health outcomes. Uh, in the 90s, growing up in, in uh, Vancouver, around the whole, again, HIV coming from monkeys, I couldn't tell you how many times people would come and ask you, well, you're from Africa, do you guys eat monkeys? Like, I never had monkey. No, I don't know. Oh, well, then do you sleep with the monkeys? I'm like, where 
do you get that? Well, where did the virus come? You guys must have somehow got it, right? So that notion of the virus is from Africa, therefore Africans must be doing something in order to get the virus, uh, the virus into their body and then spreading it to the whole wide world. That has always been around. And then, you know, with the COVID-19, again, the scientific racism of it was just glaring, right? And that resulted in serious harm to people. People lost lives. People got seriously injured because there was this notion that the virus, because it originated from a particular location, it condemns all of the people from that descent. And that is dangerous precedent. And that we all need to um, be mindful of it. I think the other, oh, this is just to say that, again, when we're reading things, they tend to tell us about the devastating effects of the diseases in certain particular communities, but they never tell you why, right? So if you look at the stats, you would just say, oh, African-Americans are dying of this. But if you dig, dig deep, if you dig deeper, excuse me, you'll find that many, the reason why they're more susceptible to this is because of the environment that they're living in. So many people were working places that they couldn't isolate. They couldn't uh, initially couldn't get the uh, per personal protective um, equipments that was uh, required. Where if they got exposed or got the virus, they went to homes that had multi or intergenerational family members and they couldn't isolate very well, right? You couldn't just lock yourself up in a room and have your whole family member stay downstairs if you're staying in a two bedroom apartment, for example. Those were what was driving the, uh, the, 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 the stats, but you don't, we don't, as researchers, as policymakers, we don't put that information out there. And so I've said that all of what we're putting out there has created this notion of the web of scientific racism in healthcare. So when you start planting this ideology that a certain group of people something is wrong with them. And that's why we're seeing X, Y, Z disease. That creates, uh, changes the way people think, the way people feel, and the way people act toward, other, uh, toward that community, creating stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination. There is ample of evidence out there that says that our stere stereotypes if affect our relationships, it affects our patient outcomes, and so it ultimately has a negative impact on the interactions that we have as nurses, as other healthcare workers in the system with the communities that we are serving. And the most dangerous part is when people begin to believe what is being told to them about themselves. So uh, initially when the virus began, the uh, sorry, COVID-2, there was this notion that people of African descent are not getting the disease. And it was completely insane, right? Like, so, you know, people were in fact saying, oh, we are immune to this. I'm like, no, you're not immune to this. This disease does not discriminate. It can't impact you and you can get sick. And of course, this debate is still going on today, right? Because there's been this expectation that the disease would just dis uh, dismantle the whole continent of Africa, and it's not happening, right? The, the, the number of people dying that um, they've been expecting, they're expecting the shoe to fall off, and it hasn't fallen off. And so it fuels this notion that, oh, there must be something about the Africans, whether it be biology or, you know, maybe they're, the, the people are dying and they're not really reporting it very well. Again, just fueling this idea of scientific uh, racism. Um, I won't go too much into this because I want to get to what are some of the things that have been uh, going on to address it. So some organizations have called for, the, for us to abandon race as a biological construct in medical research. Um, the uh, American Association of Physical <laughs> Anthropology, which I smile because anthropology is one of those uh, disciplines that really needs to be decolonized, but they themselves had put out a statement talking about this exact issue, which 
they probably they have contributed they as a discipline contributed a lot to perpetuating and this, in the statement they basically said that while race is does not accurately represent the pattern of bi uh, biological diversity the experiences of racism is real and so what that has told me is that we as a academic society need to move away from representing race as being the predictor and use racism as the predictor of what is happening, of all that we're seeing uh, happening around us. And so that was what I wrote in this paper in 2020, just saying that race is not pathological, but racism is. And so often when I, everybody you know, that I know, give a paper to students and the conclusion is this group of people have higher or worse outcomes, the paper was just calling our attention to say, you know what? It's not that these group of people, it's about the social experiences that that group is going through that is driving the outcome that you're seeing. And of course, you would think that, you know, this idea of scientific racism has been around for quite a while, but you would think that um, we have taken it out of our clinical practices. And the truth of the matter is we have not. So, you know, GFR, the glomerular filtration rate is a measure that, uh, that we use routinely in clinical practice to measure, um, to assess people's uh, renal function, the kidney function. And in the calculation of it, you can see right here, the race black. That um, notation basically says, the rationale behind it says that you know, black people have higher muscle density, and so they have higher production of creatinine, and therefore there needs to be a correction, right? So that once the individual clicks black, the algorithm corrects for it, and there's been a movement to remove that, A, eh? because the blackness of somebody's skin does not drive their physiological process like uh, renal function. And uh, another negative impact of that is there's been reports of people who are of African descent, whether it be mixed race or not, being not listed for kidney transplant because of this correction. The correction makes them not sick enough to be listed. So uh, I know there's been some work in trying to get that out of our clinical practice guidelines. Um, the second, the top panel on the right column there is from the Canadian uh, diabetes, but I believe they've changed it now. This was a couple of years ago, where again, they talk about the ethnic backgrounds of being African, Arab, Asian, so on and so forth, where type two diabetes is mostly a, a socially environmental driven uh, disease. So the pathophysiology of type type two diabetes, there's others that are very genetic, it's not, I don't inherit a gene that automatically makes me get type two diabetes. So there are genes that are implicated, but the environment, so the lifestyles, the stress, the pollution, the diet, all of those things have bigger, uh, increase the risk big, uh, larger than just whatever the genetic makeup of the person is. But when we put information out there, people starts to believe those things about themselves and maybe not engage in some of the um, health promotion activities that we may expect them to. Uh, my background is cardiology and I always smile when I see things like, does black ethnicity influence the development of thrombosis in a drug eluding stent? Thrombosis, biological process, black, and all you're measuring it as being black is based on somebody self-identified uh, saying, yes, my skin is black and I identify as black. How does that translate to changing somebody's um, coagulation profile to increase their risk of thrombosis? They never put it out there, but they do get these papers published. There was also a drug that heart failure, again, I'll stick with the cardiology that came out uh, by Dell, which was basically promoting as the first race-based drug. Hopefully you can see that the, the, the uh, <clears throat> irony of it, 
race, socially constructed concept, drug that works in your biology, how does this drug deal with it? But it was marketed as the first uh, uh, drug that was supposed to be helping the Black uh, people with heart, heart failure. Uh, it didn't last, but it had happened. And so ultimately, you know, all researchers, even as, uh, as recent as 2016, saying there's mounting evidence that show that we are so much <clears throat> different than, um, that we're much more similar than we are different. And so, you know, we need to really focus more on the experiences of our differences, which is racism, and take away this notion of race. Um, again, like I said, without, despite the calls from different, uh, uh, different disciplines, the practice still continues. So then now as a practicing nurse, as an educator, my question is how do I take all of these things that I've learned about myself, about the, so the, 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 the environment and the world that I'm in, how do I take that uh, and implement that in my work? So um, in 2018, my students and I in global health class had a, uh, a debate as to whether race is a social construct or a biological construct. They were evenly split. Uh, and uh, the following year, the same thing. So I thought to myself, you know what? We, uh, myself and another student said, you know what? We should actually capture this in a meaningful way and, and ask a larger sample of students what is it? What does race mean to you, based on your education, based on all your experiences? What does race mean? And so our hypothesis was that students would conflict race to be biology instead of social construct. Again, that doesn't seem to. That's not a far reach based on the information that I, I hopefully have presented to you. So the students were asked the term race is defined as what. And as you can see here, <clears throat> a lot of them uh, the first time, so we did this in 2020 and then 2021, a large proportion of them said that race was a socially constructed uh, variable, great. A smaller number of people thought it was uh, biological uh, per imperative. And then in the second time frame, a larger number said it was biology, but you know, a fair number said they were social. So we're not doing too terrible. I don't think. So then you ask the students then, thinking about what you know about pathophysiology of race, where does race belong in the pathophysiology and the different factors that influence the development of diabetes? Where does race belong? And you know what? The majority of them put it right here in the susceptible loci, which is the biology. All right, so if we are saying that race is social, the right answer would be to say that the social aspect drives our lifestyle and not our biology. So uh, based on the finding, we did conclude that students tend to conflate race to be a biological construct when they're reading uh, material that we give them or present to them in classes. And so ultimately what I've put forward in another paper is that, you know, we often talk about racism being a social determinant of health. I like to even go deeper to say racism actually underpin the social determinant of health. So if you think about it, in terms of, you know, food insecurity, education, economic uh, uh, stability, all of those things, they do turn to fall on the racial category. Right, so certain racial groups tend to do better than other racial groups. So whenever we see that sort of differences, it really speaks to the differential experiences of people with regards to whatever the uh, the issue is, whether it be healthcare, food, or why not. So it is my belief that focusing solely on the social determinants of health is missing the point if we don't address racism. And then I was, uh, myself and a couple of colleagues actually put that into paper that was just recently published that said that we basically need to take race out and use the word racism every time we're talking about 
Um, every time you want to use the word race, think about replacing that with racism, because really that's what we're talking about. So we need to be just really explicit so that the reader knows exactly what the relationships are with the different constructs and the variables that we are studying. And then again, uh, uh, to what Katie had mentioned earlier, led me into uh, uh, this issue of collecting race-based data. I'm super, super, I was obsessed with this because I was afraid that we were just gonna be doing the same thing that we've done for centuries without actually making any progress. And what I mean by that is race-based data has existed in a lot of societies for a very long time. It's been discussed now in Canada, but a lot of places collect it. But the problem is collecting the race-based data is useless. It's useless unless you start speaking to what that means, which is that, you know, when we collect race-based data, we're really looking for the differential treatment of people, which is racism. So, you know, in the paper, I argue that it should be called racism-based data or racism data. Um, because when we just collect the data, there is no impetus to do something about what we found. But if we say this data that you're collecting speaks to racism, hopefully it would be an embarrassment for healthcare workers, for organizations, for um, anybody out there to be able to put out a paper or put out a publication to say, you know, Black people do terrible in our facility. You know, hopefully that would be enough of an embarrassment that it will make people do something about it, right? If you find that Indigenous people are not being cared for properly in the health system, I'm hoping that when you put it out there, there will be an action plan. And then you can hold you to that action plan versus just putting it out saying, these people are doing terrible. And it becomes their problem versus the problem that we can uh, we can solve. So that was the uh, the message in that particular no okay. And then you know I'm really delighted that Kai Hai, which is a Canadian Institute for Health Information, just put out this document. By all means, if you haven't seen it, please download it and read it because I was I was quite pleased by it. And basically, what they're saying in the they put out a standards for collecting race-based data in the Canadian health system. And basically they said that the primary purpose of it is to monitor, identify and address inequities that stems from biases and racism, including systemic, interpersonal and internal levels. So again, based on what I just talked about in the previous slide, if we're collecting race-based data, and that is an indication of systemic biases and, 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 and racism, then our solutions should be aimed at addressing those biases and racism. Our solutions wouldn't be, uh, you know, I give the example to a student about uh, childbearing. There's a lot of evidence out there that says that uh, Black Americans, African Americans have uh, a lot of premature births and lower birth children. And I say to the student that, you know, my own personal childbirthing experience mirrors that narrative, which was that I did in fact have my child early and he was in fact smaller because he came back early. And so if somebody was doing a research looking at that data, it, it mirrors that. But what they don't ever ask you or nobody asked me was why did you go into labor? What happened? What caused it? And if they had done that, I would have been able to tell them something traumatic happened to me that morning. And I was just so overwhelmed with emotion. I cried for 12 hours straight. Do you think that if you took a white woman and put them through a, a similar stress that they wouldn't have the same physical uh, physiological response to result in having a child early. So if we start talking about these things and at that level, it can move us more to the proper action, 
right? So if 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 we stop at the point of black people, black women having a child early, you might be moved to give them all beta blockers or something so that you suppress their sympathetic responses, right? But if we realize that it is the environment that is causing all of these things, the outcome might be different. The outcome might be how do we support you know, pregnant women better? And not just black pregnant women, but all pregnant women better. Because that, if it can happen to me, and we're all human beings, then it means a white woman can have the same response. It means that an Asian woman can have the same response. It means an indigenous, Canadian indigenous wo woman can have the same response. So how do we support them better, women, pregnant women better than black women or other categories? So please, if you haven't taken a look at it, please do. So then uh, I'm gonna conclude by just sharing um, some of the research that we have done uh, in terms of getting this notion of scientific racism and addressing racism globally within our education system. And so this study, basically, we just finished it in December. And it was a study that basically arise from everything that I just told you. So all the things that I've told you, I'm always great about telling my students what I've learned, how I learn it, and you know, encourage them to do a similar thing and see if they come to a different conclusion. So I shared this at our curriculum meeting. And, uh, and then I followed that up with some reading material for the, uh, for the committee. And uh, the student representative on the curriculum committee reached out to me separately saying, you know what, this is an interesting topic, the issue of scientific racism, how race is not and racism is not represented in our curriculum. Uh, she, you know, she said she shared that with her colleagues and they were interested in learning and unpacking it further. And if I would be willing to meet with them in the, you know, as a group to discuss it. So I said, absolutely, you know. And so we started meeting regularly on Monday evening uh, starting 2020 and uh, what they you know what we did and they did was taking all of their syllabus syllabi from the courses that they're taking and we went through it to look and see is racism even mentioned in those syllabus is you know is race mentioned what other things are mentioned and basically they found that a race racism was not mentioned um, later on in um, their third and fourth year, uh, indigenous specific racism had been mentioned, but we all know from the, the sort of the geopolitical climate with the uh, UNDRIP and all of those, that, that there was a mandate, there was an intentional mandate for us to include indigenous specific racism into the curriculum. So that was mentioned. They also mentioned that there were, we also found in our curriculum that we didn't, um, uh, talk about other communities other than uh, the Canadian uh, Indigenous people, and that often culture was the catch-all phrase that was used, and so uh, cultural competency was the focus, but cultural competency does not address racism. So those were the, all the things that they found, and so then the question was, what do we do about this? There was several uh, recommendations that we had come up with, and one of the ones that we wanted to address was students themselves said that they have witnessed racism, they have experienced racism, but they had no idea how to address it. So we uh, apply for a grant from the University of Victoria to figure out how can we best support student nurses uh, address or embody anti-racism behaviors. And so we, um, put them through three anti-racism workshop that was facilitated by my colleague, Dr. Musa Magasa, uh, who's an EDI specialist. And the um, workshops focus on, you know, sort of giving you the historic um, information around racism, the socialization into, uh, into the word of race, world of racism, and then what can you do as an individual and what can we do at a system level? Those were the three workshops. And then the students had a brainstorming session. We asked them about, you know, what did they want to get out of the research? What the have they witnessed? And then we created a simulation 
based on those experiences and based on what the student's really trying to get at. And, um, you know, I'm not trying to took our own horn, but it was quite successful. The students, um, well, I'll show you what the students have said. Uh, just to mention that our research was informed by the transformative learning theory, uh, which the STAR framework is a more concise way of operationalizing that. And so uh, we designed our intervention to allow the students to be sensitized to the issue around racism and help them take action while also promoting reflection. So what am I learning? How is that impacting me? And is that, ask, is that motivating me to take action was sort of the cycle that we were going for in the study. And we basically found that <clears throat> through that process of sensitization and reflection, students were able to make gains in different um, areas and we coded them. We use op uh, open um, inductive coding using the STAR framework to um, help us um, identify the emerging uh, themes. So the areas were self, others, racism, and anti-racism. So the process of sensitization and reflection allows students to reflect on themselves, kind of like what I just told you about myself. How does my story of my African story fit in this bigger context of the North American African story? So you know the same thing happened to them. And then it also, um, allow them to reflect on others. What is it that other people are experiencing around this notion of racism? Again, what is the idea of ra racism? Because we're not teaching it explicitly in our nursing program. What is racism? How do I see it? How do I address it? And that part about how do I address it? In our study, we gave them specific uh, intervener uh, strategies that they can use when they um, when they witness racism. And so one of the things that somebody had uh, mentioned, one of the participants print had said was that implicit bias is actually explicit as it is received by the other person, right? Just because it's implicit, right? Doesn't mean that when I go to a store and somebody's not treating me well, that I don't see it, that I don't feel it, that I don't experience it. So I thought that was uh, sort of an impactful comment from the uh, participant. And then the notion of taking action, what we found also was that all of our participants came into the study with a high level of willingness to engage in the discussion around racism, but they had identified that they weren't unable to address racism, which was sort of the, uh, the impetus for them to wanna enroll into the study. And through the, uh, the workshop, the stimulation, what had happened is it allowed the students to continue to still be willing to address racism, but now move to a place where they're able to, wait, to see it and to address it uh, in, in, in clinical play, uh, setting or in the simulation that we gave them. And ultimately what the students said was that the simulation was the final piece of the puzzle that was needed to solidify their learning about racism, their awareness of racism within themselves, racism through their own action, the experiences of other people about racism, and now taking action to address racism. And so for nursing education around racism, um, what we have found is that when people, currently what we're doing is we're doing a lot of awareness uh, training, you know, us having this discussion is awareness, um, sharing of information. So we're increasing awareness, but what we're not doing a lot of is action. How do we enable people to embody these anti-racism um, strategies and behaviors and what have you not? Because when we don't, there is a, a sense, a tendency for students to be morally distressed almost, right? You, you got all of these things, but you're paralyzed, you can't take action. So our suggestion based on our research finding is that increasing awareness has to be balanced with action. And so if those two things are not uh, balanced, we do not, we will not get the, um, the results that we're looking for. And we may in fact, be just be morally traumatizing our students 
um, because we don't give them the actual tools to go out in the world and address, um, address it. Again, we teach them how to take blood pressure, right? If racism, if we believe that racism actually impact people's health and lives as badly as we're the literature is showing us and people's lived experiences showing us, we ought to be teaching them also how to take action to address that. So I'm just gonna conclude with this particular um, diagram, which for nurses, again, it has a nursing uh, focus, but I, I believe it can be applied in other disciplines, but working for social change, and this was adapted from Dr. Etwa's book, on this continuum of racism that we see, and I should say, my view as a racism is that everybody experiences it. There's no racialized people. We are all racialized in a, different, in a certain way. If you live in a society that is racist, right, that is built around the racist ideology, every single person is racialized. All of us fit here on this scale, whether we like it or on this continuum, whether we like it or not. And the scale is really a, a balancing act around supporting oppression and confronting oppression, right? Racism, there's a lot of power uh, involved in it, power and oppression. So if we are actively participating in racism, uh, we can do that by ignoring it. We can do it by not recognizing it. And when we're doing that, we're supporting oppression. But when we take action to either educating ourselves, educating others, and now supporting ourselves and others in preventing racism, we're confronting that oppression and therefore becoming that anti-racist society that we all hope for. And it's not just, you're not doing this for me and my existence. We're doing it for our collective existence, our collective benefit. Because if this group does well, we all do well as a society. So this is just a continuum that I use with the students to just saying, you know, where are you on this continuum? You know, are you beginning to recognize it? great and also recognizing that everybody's in a, on a journey we're all in different spot on this on this uh continuum and that is fine right i am over here you know in terms of the work that i've done individually as academic and all of those things that doesn't mean that everybody around me uh supports the ideas that i put forward but that's okay my hope is with time with education with um uh personal motivation they too would move in that direction. So as nurses, what are some practical anti-racist things that we can talk, we can do uh, when, uh, when we're practicing our profession? So uh, one thing that has been suggested that when we're presenting patients, we ought to discuss race and race-related issues in the social history of the person. So, Right now, what things usually presentations go as, Jifa is a 40-year-old Black woman who presents here with XYZ. What that would look like is Jifa presents here with XYZ, and from a social perspective, she's a Black woman, single mother, university, whatever qualifier things that you want to say. So purposely making sure that we move the discussion about race into the social uh, uh, part of our uh, charting discussions. The other thing too is around acknowledging uh, to our patients how racism and discrimination impact their daily lives and how that may actually be influencing uh, their experiences, uh, that they're, the reasons why they're presenting to the hospital. So uh, the hope, this is something that I'm hoping that our, all of our health systems will have, which is policies around what should people do when they feel discriminated against and when they're not being treated well. And that can trickle down to each individual nurses, including that in their sort of their introduction to, uh, of themselves to the, to the patient. So what could that be like? Something like, hi, my name is Jifa and I'm your nurse today. I'm going, you know, I'm your nurse today. I want to let you know that on this unit, in this hospital, in this health system, we are committed to providing you with the best possible care. 
we do know uh, uh, best possible care that is free from discrimination, from racism of all types. If you fall short, here are the ways, here are the things that you can do. You can talk to me if you feel comfortable. You can, this is where my manager is if you're feeling comfortable. If you don't feel comfortable, here is a phone number. Here's an email that you can call and leave a confidential information or whatever it might be about the way in which you are being treated. The, the, what that would do is that hopefully it would allow us to in real time address these issues so patients are not leaving our care wounded where they don't want to come back to us, get sicker before we see them, and now their outcome is going to be worse because they were avo avoiding us because of the way we were treating them. I think another important thing that we should be considering is making sure that we use this approach consistently with people. My danger, my fear, is that we are creating, the narrative is creating, is dividing us more than pulling us all together. So, you know, if, if, um, if a university, a university, a hospital, whatever, decides to implement some policy, that policy should not just be specifically for, you know, for me as a black person, but for everybody. Again, back to my belief that racism, we all experience it, whether we acknowledge it, whether it is oppressing us or, you know, lifting us up, we experience it. So if we all experience this, what if a policy is that are created should be for everybody and we should avoid othering people. And then uh, for us researchers, for us educators, we need to be mindful that the word race as the predictor is a proxy for, uh, for racism. So being uh, purposeful and intentional about sharing that with our students, our patients and larger community. Uh, this is a paper that sort of similar, uh, discusses similar things that I just talked about. And on that note, I am going to stop talking and hopefully hear from you. Thank you, Jifa. Uh, what a powerful talk that was and a lot of provoke, very thought provoking. I've, uh, I'm going to, I've got a, a few points here that I've made for myself. Um, but I would like to now um, open our, to the audience um, questions and to have a conversation on this topic and your thoughts. And I just want to remind the IT um, support, Mike and Chris, if you could stop the recording at this point so we can have a, uh, a, a conversation. Annette, what do you think? Is that appropriate that we should stop? Okay, good. Let's 